All right. With that said, let me talk about the gifts and the greatest gift. The greatest gift is not wisdom. The greatest gift is not teaching. The greatest gift here, Paul says, every one of you have a gift. But you guys are more fascinated with teachers and the wisdom they spew, not Jesus. You need teachers, but that's not the greatest gift. Let me show you real quickly. We're going to go into it, all right? Real quickly. Watch what the greatest gift is. Now, you all have gifts, all right? All these gifts are given to different members so we can depend on one another, sharpen one another, right? And use these gifts to glorify Jesus. Here it is. Let's read. You ready? Let's start at three. Well, let's start at one. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, we're going to read all the way to 13. Brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, you were being led astray to the mute idols, idols that don't speak. However, you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is the Lord except the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. So notice, Jesus is Lord, the Holy Spirit. Now notice the Trinity. Your Bible is Trinitarian. Your Bible is Trinitarian. Watch here. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. What is Paul saying? He's saying, don't think there are different gifts. That means there are different spirits. Well, there is a Spirit that gives wisdom, a Spirit that gives knowledge. You go, no, 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 no. It's one Spirit. And he gives all these gifts. But notice the Trinity. Notice the Trinity, right? Watch here. I want you to see the Trinity. Pay attention to the Trinity. Let me see. One second. Oh, come on, man. All right. Pay attention to the Trinity. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. There are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. Now, Lord here is Jesus. Look at the Trinity. What's Paul saying? Don't assume if there are different gifts, there are different spirits, a spirit for each gift. No, it's the one triune God who bestows all these gifts. It comes from one God, he was Father, Son, and Spirit. And there are a variety of workings, but the same God who works everything and everyone. Now, let me unpack this before we go on. You can see the screen? All right. Watch. Okay. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for what is profitable. Well, then what does that mean? What does it mean you've been given a manifestation of the Spirit? You guys got to listen. Class has begun. Let me explain. By manifestation of the Spirit, Paul is saying that the gift you have is a clear sign for you and the church that the Spirit is working through you, operating through you, and that this gift is from the Spirit. And he expects you to use that gift by his strength to build up the church. You understand what he's saying here? Yeah, well, the fruits are different. The fruit of the Spirit is one thing because that fruit is for all of us. All of us must have the same fruit from the Spirit. That's not the same. So take it easy. No, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22, 25 is the fruit that every Christian is given. It's not just given some. All of us are given the same fruit. Gifts are different because there are different gifts. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit. Meaning, how do I know that the Spirit's working through me? And how do you know? He will give you gifts recognized by the body of Christ. Thank you. The gift will be a sign, manifestation, a revealing spirits working through him and her and working through me. All right. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit. So the spirit gives someone to be able to make others wise and to another the word of knowledge according to the same spirit. See, it's the same spirit. And someone to know how to <clears throat> educate, how to enable someone to know what wisdom is. You see how it's working? All right. To someone else, faith by the same spirit. That's why some people, you will see, have such a faith that moves mountains because the spirit has been placed to give them 
a higher dose of faith because they're going to be given a task that's <clears throat> insurmountable, monumental, and they need that extra dose of faith for that moment. Like, let's say you got a crowd and they're about to kill you. Well, man, right there, you need the spirit to come upon you with such power and faith not to back down. Or when the lions come to tear you to shreds, you understand the point? May the spirit destroy all air in me and give me perfect recall and exegesis of scripture and give us obedience to the scripture. Right? So now watch also. And to another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. So some will be set apart with this gift to pray and people get healed. Now there's a question. Are some of these gifts still operative today? Well, if you're Catholic, Orthodox, you believe that. You believe that priests and bishops still have the anointing and power to heal and cast out demons. And to another, the working of miracles. And to another, prophesy. Now, when we say prophesy, if you look at the Greek word prophesy, it means to proclaim. Kerigma, kerigmata, proclaim. It's not necessarily predicting the future. Some have been gifted to preach. That's what prophesy, preaching. Kerigmata, kerigma, to proclaim. So some are gifted preachers. Others have to work on it. Okay, watch here. And to another, the distinguishing of spirits, discerning the spirits, meaning discerning by which influence, by what spirit someone is speaking or influenced by. Discernment. To someone else, various kinds of tongues, meaning languages. The Spirit enables folks to be able to communicate in different languages and to another to translate those languages, like on the day of Pentecost. But now notice who it is, but one and the same Spirit. It's one Spirit who is the author of all these gifts, but he's not the only one, right? Remember the Trinity? It's not just the Spirit. It's also the Lord Jesus, the same Lord. Jesus is Lord. And it's not just the Spirit in Jesus, it's also God the Father. Do you see the inseparable operations of the Trinity? They work in perfect union. So it's not just gifts from the Spirit. These gifts are from the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You see, it's a triune God, a triune faith, the same Spirit. Same Lord. Who's the Lord? He already told you. Jesus is Lord. The same Lord Jesus and the same God. God with the Lord Jesus and Spirit. They all work together. And they are all the source of these gifts. And they distribute them according to their will and desire. But one of the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. All right. So it's the spirit who decides your gift. Let me remind you this. Now, I don't belabor the point, but you got to be reminded of this. You'll have churches telling you <clears throat> that you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. So pray for it. Let me correct that, bad theology. We are told right here, it's the spirit who decides. That shows you the spirit is a person, not an active force. He decides what gift. An individual will be given. This is why for years, when I didn't know sound theology, I was told, pray to speak in tongues. And I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I never spoke in tongues. Now, I didn't know if that meant I wasn't a believer or I wasn't good enough. Then later I realized the reason why the Spirit did not give me the gift of tongues, like some insisted is because he had already given me other gifts. The gift to teach, the gift to recall scripture on the spot, the gift of being able to dissect and demolish objections against the glory of Christ. So I was so focused on that gift that I was blind to the fact he had already given me gifts, right? Because they overemphasize one gift, speaking in tongues. 
But I'm going to tell you what gift Paul says all of us must have because the Spirit wants all of us to have it. Right? All of us must have it. And it's not speaking in tongues. Now watch here. For even as the body is one, yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. Christ's spiritual body, the church, is one, but it's made of different members. Hands, fingers, legs, thighs, toes, eyes. For also by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we are all made to drink of one spirit. And when, where am I getting hands and eyes? Right here, Paul, the analogy. But I'm not going to go through all of this. Just read it. Now, let me add another point, And I'm going to tell you what the greatest gift is. Okay, mm -hmm. let me add one more point. Why do you think the Spirit doesn't give one individual all these gifts? Why? Why do you think that the Spirit in His wisdom does not give one individual all of these gifts? Anyone have an idea? You should know because I've mentioned this before, but we're creature repetition. We need to hear something repetitive. We become second nature. Why does the spirit not give one individual all these gifts? So that he does not become the focus of Christian devotion. That's why. The spirit does not give one individual all the gifts so that that person does not become the focus and attention of Christian devotion because your devotion is to the Father, Son, and Spirit. You are to be sold out for the Father, Son, and Spirit. You are to love and worship Father, Son, and Spirit and put Father, Son, and Spirit ahead of anyone and everyone and never exalt a man to that status. That's why. Because I have gifts you don't have. You have gifts I don't have to keep me humble and teachable because I need you and your gifts and you need me and my gifts because that's how the Spirit did it. So we can become interdependent and never think that one member is better than another. And never allow any one person to think he's God's gift to the church. This is God's way of destroying idolatry, blasphemy, and arrogance and pride in us. See the wisdom? This is the wisdom. This is why. You can't make me more than I am. And why? You don't feel less than I am because God gave me these gifts because he's given you gifts I don't have. That's the wisdom. The wisdom of God. But now what is, what's up, Sandra, the greatest gift? The greatest gift? Paul tells you right here. Go to 1 Corinthians 12, 31. Let me read from 28 to 31. Watch here. Yep, to show interdependency, and that's what he said, you're one body. If you read the chapter, he says, the eye cannot say to the foot, right? What are you? Or the foot to the eye, what are you? No, he says, no, 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 here, here. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, you can't say that. So in other words, Jesus is saying, if you're baptized of the Spirit and you're truly his body, I cannot say the hell with Ortho Christo. So who cares about Lepanto? No, 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 no. You better care because I designed it that you need them and they need you. But ultimately at the end, we need Jesus. And without Jesus, we don't need anyone. You don't need me. I don't need you. The only reason why you need me and I need you is because Christ made it where I depend on you, you depend on me. So I don't become puffed up and you don't become puffed up. But in reality, we're expendable. He can remove me. If I don't remain faithful, cut me off and bring someone else. You understand? And God is appointed in the church, first apostles. Notice who has the highest position in the church, Lepanto, everyone. Now, at this time, you can see the church is still in its infancy. What do I mean? When Paul is writing at this time, you don't see him mentioning bishops and deacons. Why would that be? In all probability, the reason why Paul doesn't mention bishops and deacons because the church is still young and Paul is still waiting for someone in their midst to show spiritual maturity and faithfulness to be appointed as the bishop elder of the church. You with me there? Everyone got it? Just notice 
Who holds the highest position in the church? Apostles. Who holds the second highest position? Prophets. Did you know that? That the Lord sent apostles and prophets to work together? Prophets of the Lord Jesus? But now notice who has the third highest position. Who has the third highest position? Watch here. The third highest position, teachers. Teachers. First, apostles. Second, prophets. Teachers. Teachers. Oh. Teachers? You mean moi? Moi? I hope I am. Anyway, now let me break it down. Why? Why do you think during this time the apostles held the highest office, then prophets and teachers? Do you know why? The most important aspect of the Christian faith is to know what the Christian faith is, to know who God is, to know what God is like, to know his will, to know salvation, and how to obey the Lord. Therefore, the apostles and the prophets were the instrumental means through which the Holy Spirit made known who God is, what he's like, what God's will is, what is salvation, what is sanctification and glorification. And then the teachers will take the foundational teaching of the apostles, expand and explain it. Do you see why these three are the highest at this time? Because how do you know what, Christian, what Christianity is unless someone teaches you, right? Are you seeing the wisdom why? The apostles and the prophets, because they're the foundation. The Spirit's going to reveal through the apostles and the prophets what the Christian faith is. Who God is. Who is Jesus? Who is the Spirit? What's salvation? Why did Christ come into the world? Why did he die on the cross, right? What will happen now that he's in heaven? What will happen when he returns? Will he return? How will we be saved? How will we be judged? Right? So you need teaching because that's the foundation. What is your faith? Why believe in your faith? So that's why the apostles come in first, prophets, but then teachers, because then the teachers will teach that foundational doctrine of the holy apostles and prophets, teach others, help them understand. Spound on it, clarify it. See why that's important in the beginning stages? That's why catechesis is important. That's why catechesis is important. You understand? In point of fact, if you read some of the early Christians, like Cyril of Jerusalem and his catechetical lectures, you will see that converts were expected to undergo a three year intense catechetical program for three years they would be taught the faith at least three years and then if they endured and learned the faith then they would be baptized and become members of the church you understand how important catechesis is you'll find cyril of jerusalem i believe it's him because i get him confused with cyril of alexandria he has his catechetical lectures they're online and this is what he would teach all converts. But it would take three years of instruction. Three years of instruction. You'd have to go intense catechesis. And then if you endured, you learn the faith. Then you get baptized. You understand why now? Is it making sense, the wisdom? Why first apostles, then the prophets? Because the revelation of who Jesus Christ is, his gospel, and all the other revelation needed. To live a life glorifying the Lord so you can reign with him came through the apostles and the prophets. So then you need teachers then to preserve that teaching, expound on that teaching, clarify that teaching for others. Right? Is it making sense, the structure at this time? So I want to make sure it's making sense to you guys before I move on. Before I move on. Exactly. Back then it was three years. Well, what if they die before the three years? This is where the church came up with baptism of desire. 
if you are going to the catechetical lectures faithfully and you endure it, and let's say you die, of course the Lord Jesus sees that and he'll reward your faithfulness and save you. Of course. You know me there? That's what we call baptism of desire, correct? Then who follows? Notice, miracles are not more important than teachers or prophets or apostles. Healings, notice the order. It's first apostles, prophets, then teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing. Help. Notice even administrations. Being an administrator in the church is a gift. And various kinds of tongues. Did you see the order? Tongues is not the most cherished gift or cherished office. But now notice what Paul says here. Notice what Paul says here. Are all apostles? The answer is no. Not everyone's going to be an apostle. Are all prophets? The answer is no. This is important too. Are all teachers? No. There are too many people out there teaching who have no right teaching. There are too many people who are self-appointed teachers who should not be teaching. Gino Jennings, we know he's a heretic. But I'm talking about even people who are Trinitarians or even who are Catholics or even Orthodox, you name it. They have no right to be teaching. They have appointed themselves to teach. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. That's the answer. Not everyone's an apostle. Not everyone's a prophet. Do all have gifts of healings? No. Here's for you charismatics. Do all speak with tongues? No. So why do you insist that we all have to speak in tongues? Do all translate? No. But now, what does Paul say? But you earnestly desire the greater gifts. So what's greater than all of this? He tells you in the next chapter. And I will show you, yet show you a more excellent way. Well, I'm going to make it brief. The greatest gifts are faith, hope, and love, with love being greater than the other two. Here it is. May the Lord have mercy on me and practice what I preach, because they use this against me. You're a gong, man. Here. If I speak with the tongues of men of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong, right? Yes, you call it to defend yourself, buddy. Take it easy. Or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and all mysteries and all knowledge, but and if I have all faith, if I have faith to move mountains, like our Lord said, faith of mustard seed, but do not have love, <clears throat> I am nothing. But you got to understand what he means by love, not wishy-washy, effeminate, queer love. She the fluff you. That's not love, man. There's some called tough love too. When parents discipline their children in love, I'm nothing. If I give all my possessions, feed the poor. If I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. If you really love your brother or sister, you won't be envious of them. Does not brag. Did you catch it? Love doesn't let you brag. Be full of yourself. Like certain people talk about, I've had 197 moderated debates. I was in South Africa. Oh, and in my debates in the 90s when I debated Jerry Maddox, when I stood before the mosque and I did this and I did this and me, 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 me. Sound like anyone you know? Sound like anyone you know? Brags. You should go watch my debates in the 90s with Jerry Maddox or when I debated Jimmy Aiken. Oh, when I debated John Dominic Croson and I was in South Africa and I preached the gospel of Christ. Sound like anyone you know? But wait, we're told you're not supposed to go around bragging. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. You don't look for your own self-interest. You're not easily provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered, meaning if your brother and sister have wronged you and they acknowledge and confess it, you don't do what most women do. You don't do what most women do. I forgive you, but I won't forget. Ladies, is this in your Bible? 
Ladies, is this in your Bible? If you really love, you do not take into account a wrong suffering. Ladies, mark that verse in the Bible. Etch it on the walls of your living room, bedroom. Tattoo it on your forehead and hand. Okay? Tattoo it, ladies. I'll forgive you, but I won't forget. Do you remember 45 years ago? <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. You guys have been married and still married. You know what I'm talking about. You remember 45 years ago when we were teenagers and you took me to the prom, but you didn't get me a crochet? Do you remember that? No. We actually went to the prom together? Oh, you don't even remember that, huh? Ladies, is this in your Bible? Does not take into account a wrong suffer. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness. True love hates injustice, but rejoice with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and all things. Meaning, you give your brothers and sisters the benefit of the doubt. So watch here. Love never fails. Now watch. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with because prophesying will end. Let me explain what Paul is saying here, guys. When Jesus returns, will you need to be prophesying anymore? Will there be need to proclaim the gospel when Jesus returns? No. They'll be done away with sin. It's over. It's fulfilled. If there are tongues, they will cease. When our Lord Jesus returns, Will you be needed to then speak in languages to help others know the gospel? No. He's here now. If there's knowledge, you'll be done away with. Will you need to increase your knowledge of the faith when he comes? No. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Notice, we know in part and we prophesy in part. We don't fully know all things or understand all things. Nor do we have knowledge of all spiritual mysteries or heavenly realities. We only know partially. Our knowledge is partial. You know what that means? Meophysites. You know what that means? Diophysites. You know what that means? Assyrian Church of the East. Let me hammer this. We have not been given complete, perfect knowledge and understanding of heavenly realities and spiritual mysteries. We only know in part and proclaim in part. So then why do you insist that unless you articulate <clears throat> the natures of Christ a certain way, you are a heretic? How do you know? You understand the application of 1 Corinthians 13? You understand? The application of 1 Corinthians 13 is if you have true love from God for God and one another, realize your knowledge of the Trinity, your knowledge of the person of Christ, your knowledge of heavenly realities, your knowledge of Scripture is partial. But then you'll come and say, hey, if you don't say one composite nature, composite will, off the hell you go. Hey. If you don't say diophysitism, two distinct natures, two wills, unite one person, the hell you go. Who the hell are you, man? Who the hell are you? But when the perfect comes, that's Jesus, the partial will be done away with. See, when he comes, we will be perfected. Our minds perfected. All false teaching, all error and sin, erased. Now we will see things as they are. We will see reality as it is from God's perspective when he comes. Because he's the perfect who makes us perfect. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child. Think like a child. Reason like a child. See, children don't know everything. And they are maturing as time goes by. Like here, I'm not what I'm not. Even though he's a grown man, he still thinks like a child. When I became a man... Meaning when I become spiritually mature, attain full spiritual maturity, I did away with childish things. I won't think like a child anymore. <clears throat> For now we see in a mirror dimly. Do you understand that? Meophysites, diophysites, 
you only see dimly. You don't see God as he is with perfect perception, but then you will see him face to face. Now I know in part, meophysites, diophysites, you only know in part, but then I will know fully. I will then see him as he is and have perfect perception of the Lord, just as I also have been fully known. Now, what are the greatest gifts? What are the greatest gifts? And which gift will last forever? But now abide faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. So when someone tells you, you need to speak in tongues, no, I don't. You need the gift of tongues, no, I don't. What I need is the gift of love. What I need is the gift of faith. What I need is the gift of hope. And of the three, I need love more so because when the Lord comes, it will no longer be faith because he's here. It will no longer be hope. I'm hoping for him to return. When he comes, that hope is realized. But love will remain forever because I will have to love God forever and he'll love me forever. So that one gift will never end. See what the most important gift is? Not a gifted orator, right? Not a gifted speaker. Not a gifted preacher. Not someone given recall of scripture or wisdom and understanding knowledge. That's not the greatest gifts in the sight of God. What did Paul say the greatest gift is? Love. And this is something God wants for all of you. If there's one gift God wants everyone to have is this. So you guys are amazed at the wrong thing. You guys are amazed at the wrong thing. Maga, make Rumble great again. You're amazed at someone who's gifted with wisdom and knowledge and is a gifted orator, right? He's a gifted speaker and, and how he silences opponents and crushes objections. No, that's not what impresses God. That impresses you, but not God. There you go, holding a grudge, brother. We just said, 1 Corinthians 13, you can't have an account of wrongs. You see it? So you guys are impressed with Sam Shamoon, David Wood, Jay Dyer, or it's Christian the way they speak. God is not. You understand, guys? I had to. Now, we asked the Spirit to take over a session. Obviously, if I'm belaboring this point, I believe that's because of the Spirit. Right? Do you believe your Bible? Yes, you do. Your Bible says the gift of prophesying will cease, and it's not the greatest gift. Knowledge will cease. It's not the greatest gift. The greatest gift of his love. And he even says it earlier. Here, one more time. A reminder to me. If I speak with tongues of men and angels, if I can speak the language of angels, the heavenly language, I, have no, I don't have love, I'm nothing, man. If I have the gift of prophesying, I'm nothing. If I know all mysteries and I can explain the filioque and I can explain divine simplicity or I can explain essence and energies, so what? Who gives a damn if I don't have love? Do you understand? Orthodox, Catholics, Meophysites, Diophysites, if I have the ability to expound the mystery of the filioque, true or not, or the hypostatic union. Is it a composite nature, composite will? If I can explain, expound all that, but I don't have love, I am nothing in the sight of God. So you see what fascinates you guys? What impresses you? The wrong things. You hear me there? The wrong things. Is it a reminder? Not to make me more than I am. God, destroy my pride and arrogance. Destroy every form of idolatry, blasphemy from us. Just because the Lord gifted me with the gift of gab and recall, that's not what you seek. You seek what God wants you to seek. Yes, you got to know him. I'm not saying that. No. You got to grow in your knowledge of God. You have to know who God is. And the more you worship, the more you fellowship, the more you speak to God, and the more you study his word, the more clarity and the greater understanding of God 
you will have and you need to because the more you know God the more you fall in love with him because the more you see what he's really like the more he becomes irresistible but your goal isn't acquisition of knowledge you understand if your goal is just to become knowledgeable then that's an idol are you with me there if your goal is to become more knowledgeable about the faith, then that is an idol. Anything that you seek and pursue other than God becomes an idol. That's what I'm trying to say. You're seeking knowledge not for the sake of knowledge. You're seeking knowledge for the sake of knowing who this God is, loving him for who he is and what he is. Because the more you know him, the more you understand him, the more irresistible he becomes in your eyes. And Paul says that. Here, 1 Corinthians 8, verses 1 to 3. So why are you guys impressed with the things that God is not impressed with? Why are you impressed with me? Really, why? Why are you impressed with me? Why are you impressed with Jay Dyer? Why are you impressed with David Wood or William Lane Craig? I'm asking you why, because you believe the Bible. You want what God wants for you. And you want to love what God loves. Look what he says here. 1 Corinthians 8, verses 1 to 3. Yes, zealous, right here. Now, concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. But watch here. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. See? See it? Isn't that true? Tongues means speaking in languages, Paul. You see it here? 1 Corinthians 8, 1 to 3? Did it sink in, guys? If anyone thinks that he has known anything, watch here. He has not yet known as he ought to know. See? Be humble, dude. You may think you actually know your stuff, I'm letting you know, you don't know as much as you think you do. Why do you think I get angry with people who come and pontificate? Do you see why I get angry? Thank you, brother. Uh, hallelujah. Take my gift. Use it so you can fall over Jesus Christ. But pray for me. I don't fall. Pray that I remain humble and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. You see right here? If anyone thinks he has known anything, he has yet not yet known as he ought to know. In other words... You who keep chiming in and trying to pontificate and share your so-called knowledge. Paul's saying, shut up, stupid. You're not as knowledge as you think. You're full of yourself. But now watch here. But if anyone loves God, he has been known by him. That's the key. Isn't that beautiful? Is your Bible honestly? When the Spirit moves me, and I pray it's from the Spirit, and I remain humble, moves me to unpack these passages of Scripture, remind myself so I don't become an egomaniac or an idolater, and the Lord Jesus crush and destroy our flesh and idolatry and blasphemy, lustful impurities. When I go into this, isn't that amazing? Right? See? I love this guy. Dun and <laughs> Brother, I love you. Use simple terms for people like me who are stupid. Right? When you see the depth of Scripture and the beauty of Scripture and what the heart of God is, doesn't it move you? In other words, the Bible is summed up in two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. It's all about loving God who loves you and then loving others for the sake of God. That's what Jesus said. You understand? You see, every page of the Bible is about love, isn't it? It's about love. So what's the Bible then? What's the Bible? The Bible is a manual of how to show and prove your love for God and neighbor. That's what it is. You understand? Let me show you what our Lord said. What is the greatest commands, Lord? To know that there's one God. And this God you must love with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself, because the entire law hinges on these two commands, is built on the foundation of these commands. 
so then why 73 books of the bible because the bible is a manual of now telling you how to go about loving god and neighbor in other words you got to love god and you got to love neighbor and here's how you love god you won't worship any other god you love god you won't misuse his name take oaths in his name and prove faithful you love god right you won't disobey him and obey him. you love your neighbor you won't touch his wife you love your neighbor you won't want to murder him you love your neighbor you won't that's what it is the bible is simply a manual of how to show and prove your love for god and neighbor watch here let me show you what does our lord say what's the greatest commandments lord all right Matthew 7, 12. Therefore, in all things, whatever you want people to do for you, so do for them. For this is the law and the prophets. Is it sinking in, guys? Are you getting bored? Or are you enjoying this as we go chapter by chapter and pack the meat? What is the duty? And a reminder, it's not about apologetics and debating, refuting. That has a role, right? You see what the Lord said? The entire law and prophets are summed up in this. Do to others what you'd have them do to you. Love your neighbor as yourself. And if you love yourself and you wouldn't do some certain things against yourself and you do certain things for yourself, then love your neighbor that way and don't do to him what you don't want to be done to you. And do to him what you want to be done to you. So do you understand what the law is and the prophets are? And the New Testament is, if someone asked you what the Bible is, the Bible is a manual telling you how to love your God and your neighbor. That's all it is. Because the entire Christian faith is love God, love neighbor. Love God as he loves you and love your neighbor for the sake of God. And here's how you go about doing it. That's all it is. And here, if you think I'm lying, here our Lord says here, Mark 12. 28 to 31. And one of the scribes came and heard them arguing. He recognized that he had answered them well and asked him, what commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus answered, the foremost is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love that God and no other. Lord your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. You understand? Now, guys, help me to help you stay focused. Only chime in when I ask questions. Do you now know? So if I were to quiz you, guys, what's the Bible? A manual of instructions telling you how to show and prove your love for God and neighbor. Because the Christian faith is summed up in loving the Lord your God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And loving your neighbor for the sake of God. Okay, do we get it now? So I can go into the topic. Do you understand now what it is? So if you understood and I quizzed you, my first question would be, what's the Bible? A manual full of instructions telling us how to show and prove our love for God and neighbor because that's the entire Christian faith. Love God and love your family. And explains to you how to do it. And it tells you who your God is and who your neighbor is. Secondly, what you learned is the most impressive gift and the greatest gift is not preaching. It's not teaching. It's not debating. It's loving. Loving. Carla, I know you need attention, sister. We love you for the sake of the Lord, but take it easy, sister. Just listen and chime in less. Muhammad just and get, answer my questions, please, sister. Allah Akbar. Because I read comments and I don't want to read too much comments, get discombobulated. Okay, everyone got it, right? Is that clear? I can't because I read comments because it's a class and I want the spirit to work through me so I can engage with comments. That's what classes are designed. The teacher, and I pray it's the spirit working through me to engage. That's why I very sensitive because i get discombobulated anyway we got it now so does now does that put things in perspective stop 
being amazed, blown away by people who have knowledge and wisdom and are powerful speakers and are great debaters. Stop, because that's not what impresses God. We got it? Sink it in? That's not what impresses God. You with me there? They all have a role in place. But what God says, you want to impress me? Love. Love me. Be in love with me and love your neighbor and be in love with your neighbor. 